today on Dr. Phil. I consider myself a good mother. Your niece was born addicted to heroin and methadone. That is correct. A mother wants her daughter back. Do you have a house? I have housing for her right now. Yes, okay, I do. Where, where? I have a, in a shelter. Claiming she's a fit parent. DCF, they were concerned that there were drugs in the home and that the daughter had missed 70 days of school. Is that being a great mom? I'm a drug addict in recovery, and I think I deserve a lot more credit. It's not about you. It's about the child. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Danielle and Nick insist they are great parents, despite the fact that they have been accused of feeding their six-year-old daughter once every 24 hours and locking her in a room all day while they disappeared to do drugs. Now, despite all of this, mom and dad are irate that Danielle's sister, Kimberly, was able to obtain guardianship of their now eight-year-old daughter. Now, Kimberly said she had no choice because Nick and Danielle are drug addicts with rap sheets, and all the accusations of child neglect are true. In fact, Kimberly claims her niece was born addicted, and when she finally got custody of her at six years old, she only weighed 37 pounds. Take a look. My sister, Danielle, and Nick are not capable of raising my niece. They are absentee parents. I've done a lot for my daughter, and I've done pretty damn well. Since the beginning, their drug addiction was their first priority. My niece was born addicted to heroin and methadone. As a result, my niece was hospitalized for three months. Nick wasn't around because he was incarcerated. Nick and Danielle were not good parents. I consider myself a good mother. Even though I was using drugs, I was never neglectful. They barely fed her at home. She went most of the day without being fed until like 10 o'clock at night. When I first got my niece, at six years old, she was 37 pounds. My sister would only bathe my niece once a week when she felt like it. At six years old, my niece wasn't even fully potty trained. That is totally ridiculous. I always made sure she ate, she was dressed properly. I made sure my daughter went to bed on time. Last year, my niece missed over 70 days of school. One time, my sister and Nick left my niece unattended in her bedroom with the door locked. My sister and Nick just left her there so they could score and get high. Ultimately, the courts did not see them as fit parents. As a result, I ended up getting custody. That's absolutely not true. There isn't a single document stating that I, Kimberly has full custody of our daughter. This is all Kimberly's doing. After that hearing, she went missing and disappeared. Kimberly classified us as missing persons. Kimberly started this Facebook frenzy, broadcasted to everybody that we were missing, sick, and mentally unstable. It was ridiculous. After more than a month, I found my sister and Nick on the streets of Boston. This is Methadone Mile. This is where most of the druggies live. I'm looking for my sister. The police officer is with me, and he showed her picture. As we're coming back down the staircase, she came right around this corner, and they placed Nick under arrest right here. Danielle was high. She was literally shooting up in my car. At that point, she told me, I think I'm pregnant. When Nick got out of jail, my sister immediately went back to him on the run. Till this day, Nicholas and my sister have not tried to get my niece back. They have done nothing. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that you've got this child at, at this point, and I, I think you are too, right? Yes. Now, you were asked to take the child, correct? I was asked. So you, it wasn't like you came in during the night and stole this child out of its bed. No. And what you have is custodial guardianship, correct? Correct. Until her 18th birthday. Until her 18th birthday. Most law is based on what's called good public policy, right? We have laws that follow from just what works well in our society, and, 
in our society, it's just good public policy for children to be with their parents, right? Correct. I mean, yes. wouldn't you agree? I would agree. It just, it's a normal order of things that children be with their parents. So when they're not, something dramatic usually has happened for a court to say, I'm taking this child away from their parents and putting it over here. Now, your niece was actually born addicted to heroin and methadone, correct? That is correct. And spent between two and three months in the hospital before she could be discharged, sent home. Yep. Because she was in withdrawal. Correct. She got discharged two weeks before Christmas. Okay. Of and that's very difficult for an infant. I mean, yes. they're very fragile at that point, so that's a that's a tough thing. But her parents were allowed to take her at that point until six years old. Correct. Okay. And you said at that point she wasn't even potty trained. She was not potty trained at six when I um, got custody of her. Okay. Now, I actually kind of made a list of things that, that you found particularly appalling, and I'm going to give them a chance to re respond to these. She was born addicted, and you said oftentimes she wasn't fed until like 10 o'clock at night. Yes. Just once a day, 10 o'clock at night. She okay. treated her more like a doll, like let me buy her nice uh -huh. things and, um, you know, put her hair up. And to me, as a parent, that's the last um, yeah. thing you should be worried about. How about school? So I was aware about the school. Um, she we, missed 70 she days. She missed 70 days. And this was in first, March, up yes. through March of that year. So From it wasn't even a full year. Correct. Um, I was, my sister had told me that she needed me to drive her to a court appearance, probably January, February of that year. And I did. And I asked her what was going on. She's like, I haven't taken her to school. And I was like, well, why? We were, our daughters were pretty much in the same e grade. And I said, I haven't missed a day of school. And I know you're tired. We're all tired. But you need to get her to school. And she's like, well, I don't agree with the school. So she always had an excuse. But I, wasn't, I didn't realize that she was doing drugs at that time. Well, there were doctors called a lot. Yes. She what? missed a lot of appointments. She never followed through. Well, they the started investigating. Well, the records say the doctors called 198, 198 times. 198 times, yes. For what? For just like her, phys um, for her when she first got diagnosed with autism, they got that first um, initial um, diagnosis, but there's steps that you need to take. She stopped doing it because she got that diagnosis more for money because you can provide um, disability for your child. So she never followed through. To me, it was alarming, but I never had the courage to talk to my sister about it because I, I had my own family. So I never really stepped in until that April. Okay, so, so your point is this wasn't a close call that this child was being neglected? No, correct. She, it, was, it was a dire need. I needed to step in. And you're concerned about your sister's safety as well because correct. you think she's in an I, abusive relationship. I think Nicholas is very manipulative. He's um, every mom's nightmare. Because if my daughter brought someone like that home, I would be in fear because he's controlling, he's toxic. He comes off like he's a great kid, like, but he, he'll, he'll fool you. And he's just a charmer. He likes to say, look nice and talk nice, but he's not a nice person. He dictates what my sister's doing. He doesn't let her be herself. But they're both addicts. They're both addicts. Okay, and, but he's the one that wrote in and says they have really been working on their sobriety and they were okay with you taking care of the child while they achieve their sobriety, which they now have done. Correct. But they also haven't done what the, what the courts have said. They don't have a home. They're in a shelter. They don't work. They don't have jobs. How are they going to support their daughter? Well, let's ask them that. Because they're here. Danielle and Nick are here. They claim it's been nearly two years since Kimberly has allowed them to visit their daughter, and today they are ready to fight to bring her home. Do they have a home to bring her to? Well, we're going to add them to the conversation after the break. Since we have lost custody of my daughter, Kimberly has deliberately stood in the way of us spending time with her. She'll ignore us or make excuse after excuse, and we never end up getting to see her. The way that Kim behaves, it's like she's using our daughter as a pawn in a sick game. And later, now I got the court custody. did not disagree. You went yes, behind our backs. No, and I did. did. Yes, Kimberly, you're not in custody. custody. Kim, because I'm stable. But what we you're telling me that that's Excuse okay. Me. Excuse me. You're telling me that I shouldn't see my daughter. Excuse me.
The serious accusations of neglect in a battle over who should be caring for an innocent eight-year-old girl. Now, Danielle and Nick insist their daughter has basically been kidnapped by Danielle's older sister, Kimberly. Take a look. My sister has stolen my child. Because of Kimberly, I have not been able to physically see or hold my daughter in over a year and a half. We had a verbal agreement with Kim for her to take our daughter while we worked to get clean and maintain our sobriety. Once we got clean, my sister was supposed to give me my daughter back, and that did not happen. Since we have lost custody of my daughter, Kimberly has still deliberately stood in the way of us spending time with her. Every time Nick and I make plans to see my daughter, she completely crushes it. She'll ignore us or make excuse after excuse, and we never end up getting to see her. Because of Kimberly, I can't call my daughter whenever I want to. Kimberly only allows us to talk to our daughter once a week on Tuesdays, and it's fully supervised. When it comes to my daughter's day-to-day -day life, she completely blocks me out of everything she's involved in. I don't know any of my daughter's teachers. I don't know the school she's attending, what activities she's in. I'm completely out of the loop. Nick and Neil say, we miss her, we love her. If you miss your daughter, you would go to court and do the proper thing. Where the hell have you been in the last year and a half? Hi. Mommy got caught up with her little girlfriends downstairs and left daddy to do all daddy I duty. What's even worse, they're living in a homeless shelter with a newborn baby, also born to addiction. We have a roof over our head, food in our belly, and we're getting our family together. They are not even trying to get jobs. They're waiting for the system to take care of them. If my niece went back to live with her parents, who knows what would happen? The way that Kim behaves, it's like she's using our daughter as a pawn in a sick game. Kimberly actually told me that she's keeping my child until she was 18 years old. Over my dead body, that's absolutely not happening. Okay, before I say anything to you two, I'm glad you're here, by the way, so welcome. Um, you've been listening to everything backstage, right? Yes. So you've heard everything that's been said. I'm going to let you respond to every bit of it, all right? Okay. I'm just wanting to be, let me be very clear. I would not have done this story if it wasn't for this child. I'm here for this child and what's in the best interest. If you two got along or didn't get along, you're adults, you could work that out. And right. frankly, I, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Uh, Sorry, but I'll just let you work that out on your own. But there's a child involved, and so that motivates me to be involved. But my question is, let's be commonsensical here. Do you two really think that you're stable enough, established enough, to take this child back? Absolutely. At this point? Absolutely. How about you? Absolutely. Look at, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's think about that word absolutely. It means there's no question there's no doubt in your mind. No doubt in my mind. Okay. In your tape piece, you said, I consider myself to be a great mother, that I made sure that my daughter had a great life. Yes. She was born addicted to drugs. To methadone. Is that being a great mom? No, but it's, a, it's safe by the hospital to have her on the methadone. Nick, you said that Kimberly got custody because you were never given a fair chance. Exactly, yep. How, how is that? Well, basically in the beginning when we did have the relapse, we had called her on our own and asked her, you know, we need to get on our feet. Obviously, we're not in a good position in our lives and we can own up to it. We're drug addicts When did right you now. call me? Correct. When did you call me? Because you never called me. We I, went, called I got the a phone call. And no, DCF you didn't. And was well aware of it. When? Because I got notified when I was in New York on vacation in, with my in-laws. December. Yeah. December of 2017 after 16. I had custody. No, you're such a liar, Nick. No, I never talked to you. Absolutely I will not give lying. Dr. Phil show. All so these there was never a verbal agreement. A phone record. There was well, never we a verbal do have agreement. records no. of, well, of the court. Let's take a look at the court's decision, and this is guardianship. Yeah. And, and the, the terms are pretty much interchangeable, but right. they right. use the term guardianship. So this was dated August 21st, 2017. Mm -hmm. Parent one, yep. Danielle, yep. after proper notice, did not object to said petition. Mm -hmm. Parent two, Nick, after proper notice, did not object to said petition. There was no proper notice. I went to uh, only one court date in July of 31st and was never notified of the second the court, court date, date because she never notified me. They couldn't the court find date me. Was actually me. I was in I a program. Talk. Pardon me? I was in a program. The mm -hmm. court date was in May 2017. And how come I wasn't notified? And you were on the run. I didn't find you until June. You knew you had a proceeding in the court. It's your burden 
yes. to find out when the court dates are. Right. Correct. And you, you have an address that you are to provide to the court. It's not the court's job to go out and find you. I was in a program. Well, then, so you were in a program, so right. you were somewhere that was locatable. Did no. you notify the court of where you were? Did you give them your address? Not at that time, no. Then how the hell are they supposed to notify you? Well, she knew where I was. My it's sister. not her job to I notify know. you. So how are you a victim in this? I probably should have been more, and I will take responsibility that I probably mm -hmm. should have called more the courts and figured it out, but I didn't. So why are you blaming her? I'm blaming her for a lot of different reasons. Maybe not for the court, but I, I have I'm just... I input when I get yeah, a chance. You can, you can have so I point. think we're going a little off subject as right. far as the court date, because I'll what I was saying... decide what's on subject. Okay. I'm trying to figure out right. where, what's going on with this child, right. and I'm trying to figure out the quickest way for her father Absolutely. to be right. back in her life. Right. So what I was saying, though, is, is the verbal agreement part, because the court date was way after. So when we made that agreement originally, we had asked her, nobody found us unfit. No one said there was a court you date. The courts were not involved. You DCF. Can I just can I speak, us, please? Because I haven't had a chance to speak yeah, at all. Yeah, let him finish. So if I could please speak. This is speak. the problem. You know, he gets so to finish. So DCF was involved, and they never found us unfit. There was no courts involved whatsoever besides her not going to school. On March 2nd of 2017, mm -hmm. DCF supported the allegation of neglect. Okay. Because on March 16th of 2017, mm -hmm. DCF concerns about, quote, presence of drugs in the home. Right. On March 16th, 2017, DCF urged the need for the daughter to go to school. Right. So they were concerned that there were drugs in the, in the home and that the daughter had missed 70 days of school. Right. Kimberly believes that her little sister is capable of being an attentive mother, but not while she is with Nick, who she calls controlling and abusive. We'll give Nick an opportunity to respond to that after the break. Kimberly keeps my daughter away from us because she does not like Nick. Nick ran with gangs. He's a felon. He is a street person. She's never given him a chance from day one. Me and Kim in her family's eyes, I'm a piece of And later, they think because you want a child that you can't have, that, that is this true. is your surrogate. Because of all the choices that Danielle's made, I can't continue my life. Nick is on probation for assault. I'm on probation for a fight that was between Danielle and her mother, not me. There was a huge argument between Danielle and her mother about us using. And Danielle's mother ripped our room apart searching for drugs or paraphernalia. The argument got really intense between Danielle and her mother. They were pushing each other, pulling each other's hair, and I just stepped in the middle of both of them. He went into a rage because my mother asked him to get out of her house. Then Nick attempted to strangle my mother. I saw my mother's neck. She had red marks on her neck. The next day, her mother went to the police station and filed charges against me. That's complete <laughs> Because of a fight I didn't start, I spent a month and a half in jail. Well, besides being accused of neglecting his daughter, Nick has also been accused of trying to strangle and attack Danielle's mother. Now, Kimberly says her goal is to get Danielle away from Nick because she fears He's not only a bad father, but is also controlling and abusive. Take a look. Danielle doesn't realize that Nick is ruining her life. There's no reason why Kimberly shouldn't like him. She's never given him a chance from day one. And Kim in her family's eyes, I'm a piece of Nick ran with gangs. He's a felon. He is a street person. Kim and her family's assumptions are completely based off the past. Kim tried to break us up numerous times. Kimberly keeps my daughter away from us because she does not like Nick. Nick is very verbally abusive with my sister and potentially abusive physically. Nick calls Danielle awful names, a bitch, a slut, a whore. He degrades her. Just because we argue doesn't mean we beat the out of each other. In almost 11 years of us being together, I've never called the police on Nick once. One time, a family member witnessed Nicholas hitting Danielle. On another occasion, my niece was hospitalized for an asthma attack. One of the hospital nurses witnessed Nick and my sister going at it and they notified the authorities. Kimberly accuses Nick of being very controlling and that's absolutely not true. Nick is obsessed with Danielle and controls every move my sister makes. Nick even tracks her cell phone. In spite of all Nick's issues, Danielle is too brainwashed to leave him. My ultimate goal is for her to separate from Nick. 
completely. My sister needs to realize that Nick and I have been together for almost 11 years. We have two daughters and we're growing old together. Okay, you say you never attacked. So as far as the strangling, nowhere in the police report does it say that. That's false, completely. So what did happen? What happened was, and I, like I said, I don't want to speak too much into it yeah. because legally I am on probation for it. But you've been doing and great. I did plead out guilty to it from my part in it, and half of that was because I was withdrawal and I was a drug addict. So I was in a rush to get out because I'm sick and I don't want to sit in jail sick. And what I did in my part was I did separate them, and I may have done it aggressively because I was concerned that my daughter was sleeping in the house and with them fighting, and there's an open DCF case, I didn't want it to go on any longer. So yes, I aggressively put my hands on her and separated both of them. And because she didn't want me in the house, she used it to her advantage to, and there is a video clip of it. So you separated who? Danielle and her mother. You say there's a videotape of it, but yeah. you, you couldn't find it? Oh, no, I have it. Oh, yes. Well, we asked you for it, and you, you said you couldn't find it. Well, I, I advised them that I don't want to send all of it in because it could be incriminating to other parties, and I don't want to put that in. Right. But I have no problem with it, you know, sending some of it. Because, I mean, it is irrelevant to this case anyways. They we're talking about our daughter. That's yeah. a fight between them two, like they said. It's well, a whole no, other show. Listen, it is relevant because we're talking about right. getting your daughter back exactly. to you. Yes. Right, right. L listen, I, you, you guys keep misreading me. I'm about unification of family, Absolutely. not fragmentation yes. of family. I'm about unification. Right. Which I agree. And you keep acting like I'm trying to keep you away from your daughter. Oh, that is not the case. And you keep telling me what's not relevant. You don't know what's relevant in my mind and what's not. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to find out is what I have to work with, what I have to overcome. Mm -hmm. If you have impulse control problems, if you have anger problems, if you whatever problems you may have, anything you acknowledge, man, I am there to help overcome them because short term, long, whatever, I want you in your daughter's life. So there's nothing you can tell me that I don't do, I won't do anything but put on a to-do list. Yeah, it's been over a year since they've seen us and we've worked on a lot. We're under 24 hour supervision in that shelter and they think we're great parents and I am definitely changed compared to what they know over a year ago. You know my biggest concern? I have one major overriding concern about this whole thing. One major, it doesn't have to do with an event, doesn't have to do with conduct, doesn't have to do with anything. I have one major overriding concern. I'm going to tell you what it is right after the break. This is an online ad. This would be a threesome scenario. We would like a safe, cool, sane, down-to-earth guy. Those are my pictures, obviously. I don't know how those got up. Last year, my husband and I started IVF process because my sister went missing. I had to stop to take custody of my niece. Kimberly's using our daughter as a permanent play date for her own daughter. Kimberly will dress them the same all of the time. Their Easter dresses, school outfits, and their backpacks. They have bunk beds, like just everything, like they're siblings. This is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. This is as bizarre as it gets. Danielle believes that I took custody of her daughter to fill that void, which is so far from the truth. It drives Kimberly crazy that I have three children and she has one daughter. Well, it's been 17 months since parents Danielle and Nick lost guardianship of their now eight-year-old daughter to Kimberly. Now, Danielle believes Kimberly's inability to have a second child could be the reason she refuses to give back their little girl. They think because you want a child that you can't have that, that this true. is your surrogate. I have to stop IVF because the fact that I got told to come into court and get custody. That is the reason why I haven't had a second child. Because of all the choices that Danielle has made, I can't continue my life. You know, I, I said there was one thing that's just really overriding here. Uh, this speaks to it. Danielle's 20-year-old son says he witnessed Nick hit Danielle. Let's hear what he had to say. I'm very worried about my mom. I've seen fight myself, heard fight. I've seen him grab her inside of her room, shut the door, and then start, like, trying to shake her. I've seen him throw stuff at her. He actually shoved her and then she like hit her head off the fridge. There's situations where he pulled out a knife and cut his own wrist to try and like
there in my moment for like staying with him. There was situations where, you know, I had to put my head back on him. There was a lot of aggression, a lot of assault going on there. If it's like a, a serious argument, they're most likely going to be fighting all night long. There's most likely going to be physical contact. I'm definitely worried about her safety. I feel like she picked her boyfriend over uh, me and my sister. It's like nothing happened and she feels like she did nothing wrong. Okay, what do you think about what your son's oh, saying there? All through, uh, everything he's heard. See, the thing is that people don't know is I've lived with my mom for years, with my son. My mom's a very controlling person. This, everything he's saying is my mother, totally. Every single sentence that came out of his mouth is something that my mother has drilled into him. I understand he's 20. My son has seen a lot. Of course, I'm not a perfect person. I well, are, are you saying he didn't faults. see what he said he saw? Some of those things, I'm not saying we, 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 it's all been roses and uh, candy between me and him, because it hasn't. He's never been suicidal in his life. He's never had any no suicidal problem. tendencies. Well, he's not he's saying sure. he was suicidal. In fact, he's he said never he was manipulating. It. I mean, it was an attempt to control you. No, that's absolutely false. I mean, the slightly like worse thing is absolutely okay, false. Okay, then here's Completely one other thing false. that goes to my main concern. Completely false. This is an online ad allegedly posted night. by Nick. Couple needs host slash place to crash. We are traveling and need a host and somewhere to crash for some adult late night, early morning fun. This would be a threesome scenario. We would like a safe, cool, sane, down-to-earth guy who's cool and okay with us staying the night. And then there were pictures that we've had yeah, we to edit. This. Yeah, we knew about this, that she already showed me the stuff before my sister. Okay, so who posted this? We have lost our phones. Those are my pictures, obviously, pictures that I have. I don't know how those got up. I have no idea. We don't do things like this at all, so I have no idea where that has come from. You didn't place that in? No, absolutely, absolutely not. not. Absolutely not. But that's your picture? Yeah, that is my picture, yes. Uh -huh. I mean, if you leave your phone somewhere and there's yeah. pictures on there, anybody can do whatever yes. they want to do. Yes. And this is when you were on the run? Yes. Was this on the run? May of 17? May of 17 is the... If we weren't at your house, so obviously yeah, you were in the bed then, because that's yeah, your yeah. bedroom, so. Yeah, right. Okay, so you were on the run at this time? Yes, yes, correct. Okay. And that's my bedroom, and I was not there. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Those are old pictures. Yeah. Right. I was I in mean, a totally were... different city at that time. That's my yeah, old pictures. Yeah. I'm not saying they were current no, pictures, but they were pictures that current. were put up Correct. while you were on the run. Correct. Correct. There's um, a lot of things so put who, up about me. That's knew, what I'm trying to say. Who knew you were on the run and you, someone stole your phone? Yeah. Well, I don't know. We they left stole it or left it. Yeah. We left it at a house. We forgot it at someone's house. We never got it back. Yeah. Like, not good people, so. This is what you're not getting. What, what I'm a drug we, addict in recovery. And I think I deserve a lot more credit than what I'm getting. But it's not about you. It's about the child. I asked the two of you, do you feel like you are ready, willing, able, and prepared to be quality parents absolutely. for this child and, and your response was absolute. Yes. The very fact that you don't recognize that there are real problems, real shortcomings, real challenges that make absolutely a really unrealistic answer, that's what bothers me the most is your problem recognition skills your lack of insight into what's going on, that to me is the biggest concern because I told you issues and problems I can put on a to-do list, but if you don't have insight, if you sit there and say, well, I got it, you're I got really, it, We're, we are absolutely I'm not, I'm not saying I'm perfect. What I'm saying is I've turned my life around. This is what you're not getting. What, what I'm a drug we, addict in recovery, and I think I deserve a lot more credit than what I'm getting. We I provide. came off 13 years of sobriety. But it's not you about don't. you, it's about the child. I this is why Absolutely. we're here. Absolutely. This isn't about her. This isn't about me. This is about my daughter. 
my daughter. This okay. isn't about what's and best for her. And how many her, times have you been to rehab? Yeah. In my whole life? Yeah. Probably about 10 times. About 10 times. How many times have you this been to rehab? This is in the past, though. Numerous. But I've been I think you said 15. But she 10 times, 15 times. But do you understand that I had 13 years sober? Right now is Did you? Where's the 13 years sober that Has she said 13 that? 13 years? Methadone is not being sober. Methadone is not being sober. Absolutely. It's not being sober. It saved my life. It saved my life. It's a drug filling another drug. Listen, that's fine. Listen, it's a legal prescription. Can I speak? Can I speak? It's a legal prescription is right. I've been clean for 13 years. I'm in counseling. I go counseling twice a week. I am but you're I'm also a great child. Standing. Do you have a house? Do you have a house? I have a housing for her right now. Yes, okay, I do. Where, where? I have a, in a shelter. It doesn't matter. It's a family shelter that's legal. With our own room, and we're waiting oh, for it's our legal. One room. It doesn't one matter. Room. They get They put me in a huge room. They're putting us They put us into an apartment. You know what? Danielle, you're not capable right now. I proper service at home. That we're not capable. There's women in there right now that have their children in there. The court obviously disagrees with you. Can I speak now? I have an eight-month-old daughter right now, and I got. The court did not disagree. You went behind our backs and did that. You went behind us. Listen, when you left the court that day, when you both jetted, she couldn't come in. I never seen any people saying that we were there. Did you go behind our backs? Just because you, Kimberly, you're not a safe person, Kimberly. Custody, because I'm stable. But were we there? You're not a safe person, Kimberly. Listen, you were never there. You didn't come and leave? So, so why she was you ripped give... from our custody. Yes. She wasn't ripped from your custody. Okay. DCF right. called was you neglected. Was she ripped from our custody yes. at all? Yes. How was Where? she ripped? Where's the paper saying that she was ripped from us? No, there's no You ripped. have it. I you can provide that and I will follow down and say, you know what, you're I right. I gave her to you. Excuse I'm me. I'm clean and sober. I have I'm counseling. Excuse, I've excuse almost me. two years sober. And I haven't seen my daughter physically in almost a year and a half. And you're telling me that that's okay? Excuse me. You're telling me that I shouldn't see my daughter. Excuse me. If anybody's curious <laughs> as to why I allowed this to go on, it's because I really believe that the way people conduct themselves here is a mirror to the way they conduct themselves out there. Correct. Which again, makes me really question that word, absolutely. <laughs> um, we have to take a break, then I'll let you have the floor when we come back. Next, Kimberly says that her niece is thriving in her care and accomplishing major goals she doesn't believe would have happened if the eight-year-old lived with Nick and Danielle. We'll talk about that after the break. My sister underestimated her daughter. Doctors have come up to me praising the work I've done with her. Don't get me wrong, I am glad that my daughter is thriving with Kimberly and her daughter, but don't try to compare you to me because there's no comparison. I'm her mother. Well, parents Danielle and Nick insist that despite being homeless, that they have turned their lives around and are ready to have their eight-year-old daughter back. Now, Danielle's sister, Kimberly, is adamant her niece should stay with her until she turns 18 because she is thriving under her care. Take a look. Since my niece has been in my custody, her life has changed immensely. She has improved in every single way. Kimberly is trying to compete with me, especially in court, trying to say that she's doing better with her than in my custody. Kimberly rubs it in Danielle's face. When I first got my niece, she was malnourished. She was 37 pounds, and she weighs 52 pounds now. She had autistic signs. She would rock, be repetitive. Immediately, I took her to get evaluated for her autism. Now, she shows no signs. She's very social. She's on Girl Scouts. She has learned how to play hockey. This summer, she learned how to dance. She's a cheerleader. She swims. She's done so much as any other little girl would do at her age. Kimberly's putting her in all these activities, chilling, dance, tap, ballet, baseball, hockey, like brownies. You don't need to do all those things. And I think it's completely overwhelming her. My sister underestimated her daughter and pigeonholed her with her diagnosis of autism. Danielle barely let her play with other kids. During pool time, she would keep her on a mat off the side and never let her explore and be a child just because she's autistic. Doctors have come up to me praising the work I've done with her. They are very impressed with her progress. 
Don't get me wrong, I am glad that my daughter is thriving with Kimberly and her daughter, but don't try to compare you to me because there's no comparison. I'm her mother. If my niece went back to live with her parents, I think all the progress that she's made could be undermined. That notion is insane. She would be just fine with her loving parents and her newborn sister. What, what have y'all heard me say since you got here? Anything stick out? Can we have our daughter? Do you think that we'd be able to handle it? Your concern it? is why concern. we said absolutely. Yeah, 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 that sticks out to me. My concern would be that we are sober and we have provided all our drug tests for an over almost two years now. Right. Which I think and that's been left out. Right. I, I think a lot the, the turnaround of, in our life has been completely left out. Left out. And that, so the fact that we are caring for an eight-month-old child and we have had support Very from good. letters that I provided as well. Right. Well, I'm not surprised that's all that you've heard uh, for two reasons. One is I, I, I think you've kind of got a closed mind, and the other is that you've been talking amongst yourself while a whole lot else has been going on, like while I'm talking, while tapes are playing, while things are going on, that a mass kind of a overall presentation, you two just have a conversation between yourself and ignore everything else that's going on. If we're not fit, then how come in the States as we're fit to care for an eight-month-old child? That case is still open. It's mandated that we are in a shelter, right. and when you have a methadone baby, that they have to you know, watch over the case. And if you were to speak to them, they said yeah. that we're doing great, and right. they have nothing right. bad to say about us right, right now. Do you want your daughter back? Why don't you provide for her like yeah, a man? I'm not going to speak about that. Stop talking. Why are you still going back and forth with her? Like okay, that? we're, 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 we're going to take a break, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to tell you guys what you should ask me, uh, because there's information that I have <laughs> that can lead to you getting back in your daughter's life. And the fact that you're not interested in hearing that it's just astounding to me. It's absolutely astounding to me. So I'm gonna talk about that after the break. If I was involved in this case as the ad litem for this child, I wouldn't have spent as long as I've spent with you here today before I told you you needed to just leave and when, come back when you're serious about getting back in this child's life. Um, because when you tell me absolutely I'm ready, then that, that tells me that you're not being realistic. And you know, there are, there are basically 10 things that I always looked at when I was determining whether someone was fit. And number one was whether they could provide a safe, stable, and secure environment for the child. I actually think that can happen in a homeless shelter. I, I think you don't have to be in a mansion. I think that I would rather a parent be under a bridge in a box and give a child too much love and not enough money rather than the other way around. So I don't think that being in a homeless shelter disqualifies a parent from being a good parent. I don't think it's a long-term solution, but you have to be able to maintain a loving, stable, consistent, nurturing relationship with a child. You have to attend to the daily needs of the child, feeding, clothing, and physical care. You have to attend to adequate education for the child, provide financial support for the child, the ability to identify and prioritize the child's needs ahead of their own. And I, I look at these things, and history does not predict that that would be the case, which means that you need to take steps to demonstrate. You need to create a new history, a new history. And by the way, she doesn't have the right to turn this child back over to you because once you enter the system, you couldn't give that child back right now if you wanted to. If you did, you would be in violation of the law, you would be guilty of negligence, and you could be prosecutable for abandonment Correct. of that child. Correct. So you don't have the right to do that one way or the other. Right. So you need to understand that very clearly. So you can right. bark at her till the cows come home. She doesn't have the right to turn that child over to you or she would be guilty of abandonment. Uh, you have to empathize and meet the child's needs. You have to regulate impulses and emotions. Well, I just saw how that worked out. <laughs> you have to assist the child developing and maintaining appropriate relationships and exercise appropriate judgment regarding the child's welfare. And when you get ready to do that, you let me know and I will get you professional help 
that will guide you in doing that. Someone that will guide you toward family unification. I'd rather you be happy. I would rather you be unified. That's what matters. If that's what you want, that will be your number one priority. And when it is, you let me know. I want to thank all of my guests today. I will see you next time. Thank you.